It's Comics of Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every Wednesday at 12.30 Eastern Standard Time at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan on the corner of 5th and William. And uh, my name is Jersey Joe. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today are some exciting people, uh, starting with uh, the amazing Janie Ho of ChickenGirlDesign.com, The Reindeer Rebellion, and then Light the Menorah are both available on your site. Yeah. I'm, well, right now I'm working on a follow-up of the Reindeer Rebellion book for Sterling that's coming out next year, next Christmas. And, yeah, that's what I've been doing. I've been working on that. And they gave, gave me only three months to work on it, which was a lot shorter than the previous books. So I was just like, I can't do anything else but just this book and just try to get it out the door. So. And are you, are you doing these in Illustrator? Yeah, Illustrator? this is the first book I'm actually doing the sketches in um besides the thumbnails like in pencil but everything else i just did grayscale in illustrator oh wow yeah first time so we'll see how that turns out i think it's okay <laughs> it's looking okay so your stuff always looks pretty good i'm, oh, I'm sure it's so. gonna be well received and then also you did a couple graphic novels you did t-ball trouble and lily's lucky leotard yeah. uh, who, who, what company was the, were those for i think capstone was. They were like for like young readers. Oh, they're really they're for really young readers. So really simple. So a lot of work. That was like the, my first little taste of like doing comics and even for little kids, it's so much work. It's because it's like every panel. I feel like it's its own illustration. So. Mhm. Mm yeah. 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 The comics page has upwards of you know four to six to even as many as nine illustrations on there. Yeah. So it's pretty challenging. It, isn't it's it? a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, like wow, a lot more respect for comic artists now. So well, you are a comics artist. Yeah, what are you talking about? Yeah, but to do it in Illustrator, that was a little crazy. I, th I felt like that was a lot more work. Yeah. Than just like doing it by I don't know by hand. I don't know. Well, well, maybe we can get a demo later on. We got it set up so that we yeah. can do a demo. <laughs> if, if you found this out like, like five minutes ago, everyone. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> JD got here. I was like, hey, good news. You get to do some drawing on the air. Isn't that yeah. fun? What you normally get paid for, I'm asking you to do for free yeah, on my show. Sure. Oh, I'm such a good man. Uh, Ryan, uh, you gosh, you do a lot of stuff. But first, got to congratulate you for getting into the Machine of Death anthology. Your okay. story, you got a story in there coming out. When does yep. that come out? Uh, it comes out sometime next year. They haven't announced it yet. Hopefully, it comes out on one of the days that a Glenn, book, a Glenn Beck book comes out because last time that, uh, that worked out for him. Yeah. Got a little bit of a friendly rivalry going. For more on that, you can check out Comics Are Great, episode 14, comicsagreat.com slash CAG14, where David Malky was on, and he talked about that. Yeah, Glenn Beck wound up uh, poo-pooing Machine of Death, not understanding what it was, yeah. which kind of helped rocket it to the number one slot on Amazon when it came out. Yeah, right? as soon as I found out I got in and I went to uh, Amazon to figure out when all his books were coming, and I put it posted, this, we need to come out on one of these dates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but so what, what's your story going to be for it? Um, it's called uh, Killed in a Riot, and it's kind of based on my time in India. It tells a story about, what the, well, for those that don't know what the machine of death is, it's a series of stories about a machine that um, you put your finger in it and it will tell you how you will die, like in a short sentence, and you don't know when, but you know how you will die. And my story is how that would affect uh, the culture in India, and it's based on all the things that I, I uh, noticed when I, I lived there for a little over two years working in an Indian call center. Cool. So, yeah, that's that's at machineofdeath.net is where you can find out more about it. So you're going to be doing a podcast for it because they also do yeah. podcasts mm -hmm. on the site of, like, readings of the stories from the book. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of really cool media on that site. Mm -hmm. So uh, first, I had to congratulate you for that. The other thing that we didn't get to talk about, it came out right after you were on the show last time, was the complete Ryan Estrada collection. What is this? It, it's at uh, ryanestrada.com slash complete. So. Well, I mean, it, it, that actually might have been after um, – talking about that. I was always talking about making things as easy as possible for readers, and I realized that if I'm giving my stuff away for free anyway, why not just make it as easy as possible? So I uh, turned them all into ebooks, and I made it so that with one click you can download every single thing I ever did, which is like thousands of pages worth of comics and uh, hours worth of my adventure videos, and you just click them. There, you don't, it's as no strings attached as possible. Like I I don't even have anything to track how many people download it. It's just you click <laughs> wow. a button and a I file starts. <laughs> you click a button and a file starts downloading on your computer. It's like yeah. one gigabyte and has everything I ever did. And uh, is all this stuff under Creative Commons yep. that you released? It's wow. all released under Creative Commons, so you can post it anywhere else you like and just, just spread it out there. I want people to see what I do. 
which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. I, I, I also would be remiss in, uh, if I didn't bring up the fact that, let's see, over the last six months, you were almost eaten by piranhas. Mm -hmm. You were dropped off in a disputed zone between some different criminals yeah. <laughs> where the cab driver said, I'm not going any further. You get out and walk. Yeah. And then you in found out. A little coca war, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you were in South America and you had a lot of adventures. I mean, you were telling me about this when you were in town recently. Uh, man, your guide in South America sounds like a real character. Like, what? Yeah. How, how many times did you almost die? A lot. <laughs> I mean, well, m most of my the stories of when I travel are situations where I had no idea I was about to die, but I found out later, and I'm like, oh man, that's a good story. <laughs> so I'm I'm never like walking through thinking I'm in a dangerous situation, but like the guide you were talking about was when I I took a trip uh, through the Amazon, like a river trip on a boat, and it was just this this crazy jungle man. That that's what he does. He does these trips and he just kept saying, oh, you can do this. It's perfectly safe. And as he would say this more and more, we would realize that his definition of safe is not the same as ours <laughs> um, at all. Because, you know, the first time it was, oh, yeah, it's perfectly safe to swim here. There's piranhas, but it's all right. And it was fine. But then later he's showing, a, you know, a few hours later he goes out to the same spot and starts pulling crocodiles out of the water with his bare hands. Like baby crocodiles, yeah, it was right? Ba it, okay. it was a baby no. crocodile. But, no. Like, no. You know, babies typically hang out with their mother who's just under the water. Oh, God. Um, and then uh, later he told us again it was safe to swim there. There weren't that many piranhas. And then we find out he's he starts yelling at us. We have to move our feet in a certain way because there's uh, giant uh, man rays. That, you know, that I'm like, oh, the thing that killed the crocodile hunter. Thanks for telling me. Um <laughs> And, wow. then, and then uh, at the end, we found out that he taught all his babies to smoke because his shaman thought that it uh, told him it was safe. At night, he, he and his whole family, which is a three-year-old, a six-year-old, a nine-year-old, and a bunch of adults sit and watch TV and smoke together. Well, di didn't you tell me something about where they like they believe that blowing smoke on things was like a, a good thing to do? Like, yeah, it, it gets it... rid of evil spirits. Like they, uh, at night, the each one of them will go to a room and take a puff of the cigarette and blow it in the room to get rid of the spirits. And if someone's sick, they'll blow it on whatever part of their body is sick. Wow. I thought it was a joke at first because it was, it was starting to rain. We were camping. And he's like, oh, I'll get rid of the rain. And he, uh, and he starts doing that to the rain so the rain clouds disappear. And I thought, oh, he's just teasing, you know, teasing the gringos. And later I'm like, oh, that's a, a thing that you believe happens. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so a very different standard of safety mm -hmm. <laughs> where you were. Uh, so... Okay, so piranhas and then the crocodiles. Uh, but, yeah, tell us about the Cocoa War situation that you found yourself in because that was frightening. Yeah, well, the Cocoa War, I was going to where I met the, the guide to go through the Amazon, and it's like there's only one road to go to this whole half of the country. That's why I had to, like, go, like, 20 hours to the south of um, Peru and 20 hours all the way back up because there's one road. It's like a, I think it's an 18-hour trip, but I we decided to stop halfway. Um sleep and then take the next nine hours and we woke up and everyone says oh there's no there's no bus over there i'm like this the that's the only place this road goes how can there be no bus is there a problem oh no 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 just take this car to this town and uh just change cars and no problem so i did that and they every car would say yeah i'll take you to this town but no farther you have to change cars and i kept saying is there a problem no no no, no problem just give me five bucks i'll take you there and this kept happening and the vehicles kept getting smaller and smaller until i'm in like an auto rickshaw um, um, and we're just going to, to, to like our rickshaw is basically like a riding lawnmower with a thing around it and eventually this guy stops and says get out and I'm like what vehicle are we getting in now he's like no walk and I'm like w what he's like I'm not going through there I'm like why not you know we're speaking broken Spanish but so we're walking we realize that there's no cars on this road this is the only road to go this half of the country there's nobody there except for one time we saw a giant army truck full of dudes with, like, AK-47s. Oh, my God. And the, we start seeing, like, broken glass that's been swept aside, trees that have been cut down that looked like they were blocking the road and someone moved them. There's, like, scorch marks where it looked like something blew up or was on fire. Oh, my god. And gosh. I'm like, something is clearly wrong. And this just kept happening. And eventually it got there. After many more tribulations, we got there and... Uh, I ran to Google News and found out that there was a state of emergency declared because the coca farmers had, like, a war with the equivalent of, like, the, um, what is it, DEA there, and uh, shut down the road, and they declared a state of emergency and went in, arrested everybody, and then, 
saw pictures of people like lobbing like homemade bombs and it was Molotov cocktails, like hours like before we got there. But n- no one would tell us that because they wanted the five dollars for the for the ride. <laughs> for the ride. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Somebody's got to be wondering. Somebody who's listening or watching this. Uh, why go? Why put yourself in those situations? What are you crazy? I don't put myself into. I, <laughs> basically, the way I live my life is I just um, don't plan things before I do them. Yeah. I just, you know, the only plan was to go take a nice little Amazon trip. I just, you know, didn't research the road I was taking <laughs> to get there. You, know, so, you, you also went to like Machu Picchu, oh, yeah. you know, and and there's all these great pictures of you on Google Plus with you with like hamming it up for the camera with a big pile of skulls behind yeah. you. And where catacombs. Was the, yeah, where was it? Catacombs the... in Lima. There's a church uh, okay. underneath that is just full of old skeletons and stuff. Yeah, and they, they, it wasn't no haunted house. That was a real thing. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, you went on this trip to see things, but yeah, you, then you find yourself in all of these crazy predicaments. Uh, mm-hmm. But also, you know, not everybody goes to South America or, or Central America and says like, hey, I know, I'm going to go walk around in the jungle for a while with a, with a jungle guide. You know, that's a little bit out, outside of uh, the AAA planning guide, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I do things that just, like I, the way my mind works, I just, hear about some, something and I'll read an article and be like, oh, I'm going to do that. <laughs> and I don't do any, go any further and like figure out, like research it further. I'm just like, yeah, if I just head that way, I can do that somewhere. Yeah. Just <laughs> show up and look for a guy that does that. And there you go. Um, but, but to keep things moving, because we got a lot of stuff to talk yeah. about today. Uh, you got back, you got back home and you found out that you had 50,000 people following you on Google plus. What the <laughs> heck did you do? How did you do that? Cause I mean, that's the, the, when you were, both of you were on episode 17 of comics, great. That was what we were talking about was like marketing and, and self promotion and, you know, uh, following your, your certain style of, of, you know, like your headline was marketing is just talking to dudes. But, you know, I was trying to uh, jot down some things, uh, you know, like I remember right when Google Plus was in beta mode and everybody was signing, all these people were signing up, um, you started getting a ton of followers. And I think I remember uh, you doing all these different Google Plus guides, like a guide to, here's how photos work. Like you instantly recognize that, oh, this is a great platform to post comics on, mm-hmm. providing your comics are more horizontally, yeah. uh, you know, landscape. Uh, sort of proportions. Uh, but you start putting out these guides like, oh, here's how it works. Here's how you can think about it. It wasn't like a definitive how-to, but it was just like a couple of little like cool graphical and comics guides to get, getting cartoonists involved in this thing. And I think that was part of like, that was the first thing I saw of yours that was getting shared around like crazy. Yeah, I, my early stuff started getting shared so much that Google like stopped counting. Now they can count more, yeah. but the, I guess they just didn't think anything would be shared that much and it just would stop counting. I'm like, you're Google. That's what you do. <laughs> but like basically, you know, when I started, I just started because people kept inviting me and I'm like whatever I'll make an account and yeah um which is what I do with every social network and then I end up like getting into it but I just it just so happened that at that time it was in beta and people were joining but I was the only one of the few people that was actually posting new original content like everyone was posting um animated gifs of someone with a uh, face or a Facebook face being punched with someone by a Google Plus face yeah. and all that but yeah. I was posting content and people were just latching onto it because they wanted to see what the the system could do. And I I first posted my graphic novel, Aki Alliance, like accidentally. I was just like, <laughs> I'm going to post some. And I'm like, I wonder what happened if I just selected all 200 pages and dragged them. And then click, oh, my God, I just posted a graphic novel. <laughs> and I start reading through it. And I'm like, this is better than reading it on my site because it, you know, dims the outside and it, f- it fills the screen and you got the little next button. It, it does a really good job of presenting yeah. albums that way. Yeah, if and they're, um, you know, like you said, if they're horizontal, it works really well. Yeah, because I posted and, mine, which is more vertical. And yeah, and the, it didn't didn't take as good because it it, it, yeah, it shrinks so and much. you can't read it. That's right. Yeah, um, that's why I started some of my other stuff. I I cut the pages in half and and do it mm-hmm. that way. It takes a lot of work though. But anyway, I just and then I started posting the guide just because I was like, oh, that was cool. I got to tell some other cartoonists how to do that. Yeah. And it started getting shared like crazy, and. Basically, that's just what happened. I just started being one of the people that was testing it and seeing what you could do and seeing what you could put on it. And then I guess while I was gone, uh, Google Plus introduced their, like, uh, you know, when new people join, it recommends who to follow, and I'm on that list. So it's like, oh, you should follow um, Snoop Dogg, Britney Spears, and Ryan Estrada. All right. (laughs) So I just keep getting, like, a 1,000 people per day adding me. 
Um, and the circle sharing thing happened too while you were gone, mm -hmm. and everybody started sharing their circles, which yeah. also everybody got like a big boost in followers. Mm -hmm. But uh, so so, but I mean, like, what what else would you attribute to like this, you know, this this uh, big success story of? Well, it it's just a matter of uh, working in a in a community, any kind of community. Like I said, it happened because it was something new. It was a community, and people weren't sure what it was yet. And it like the first comic I ever got published uh, online was called High Hunter, and I did it for the uh, Quaker Parakeet mailing list. Before I even had internet, I had Juno, which was free email, and you couldn't go on the internet. You could just like log in through a phone line, and it would download your email real fast and kick you off. Okay. And I was on a Quaker Parakeet mailing list because I had a Quaker Parakeet, and I started like just posting comics on the mailing list, and then those people would post it on their sites. And I had this huge following they, just from just from posting these terrible comments. Like, that's when I was, like, 13 or something like that. Wow. And it's just, if you can go into a community, uh, and it it's not like you can't just be like, oh, I want to go into that community. Like, I've tried to get my comics on um, attention on, like, Reddit or the, these other sites that I'm not a member of the community. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, dig, stuff like that. Um, you can't just jump into a community and be like, hey, everybody, look at me. But if, you, <laughs> if you're actually part of a community and you understand it, ju you can just accidentally do Like I opened my, like I said, I opened G um, my Google Plus account just so people would quit bugging me to join Google Plus. Right. And I accidentally did this. So it's just a matter of when you are a part of something, you know, artists will look at something and be like, how can I, put comics on this? How can I put paintings on this? How can I put... It's just something you do naturally. And just don't be afraid. To, don't be like, you know, I'm not going to focus on the, you know, it's a small community. I'm going to post my comics in this place where I've seen other people make it big. But they became big there because that's their world. Right. Go Actually, somebody in the are. chat, I, th I, I believe this is either Dave Roman or Raina Telgemeier. I'm sorry to call you out, but... Uh, uh, Maribel Mellonbelly. Uh, Ryan was a star of Live Journal back in the day because he did that Live Journal jo Live Journal Goat comic. Yeah. What, what was that? I, I've never been part of Live Journal. Yeah. It was just um, Frank the Goat was their mascot, um, and I just randomly emailed them one day at like three in the morning. I'm like, hey, it'd be cool if you did a comic with him. I bet I could get a lot of followers. And I just because I had, you know, that was another community that I was a part of, and I understood. And they emailed back and like, sure, you can do that. So I did it, and all of a sudden I had, you know, millions of followers there. Wow. Working on that. But th then LiveJournal kind of disappeared after a while, and as the new social networks came out. And... Wow. Well, it's still going, isn't it? Yeah, it's, people are still on it, but it's kind of, um, it's not what it used to be. Okay. But it's not, it's not like MySpace where it's like a mass exodus. All oh, this place is, is like the ghetto now. And it's, still, it's still cool to be on Live Journal. You just yeah. don't get the interaction that you used to. Okay. Uh, so, okay, I wanna, I'm going to change gears a little bit. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, I think that was really stellar advice. It's like, it's like play, in the, play, play with the natives when you are in, engaging on a network of, of any type, right? Yeah. As, as, uh, I mean, th this is very similar to what webcomics advice was back in like 2002, which was go on to forums where people are talking about stuff, get involved in the community, listen to the conversation, then contribute to the conversation. That's how yeah. you get noticed. You don't just go in with your big banner and say, hey, look at my comic. I did a comic. Isn't it cool? Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, it's, it's doing that in something you're already a part of. If you go into somewhere wanting to, you know, win them over so you can sell your comic, it's still not going to work. You got to. Yeah. Because it's not something you're genuinely interested in, and people can tell that. So, you guys ever see Happy Gilmore, that old Adam Sandler movie? Yeah. And and then Shooter McGavin is is hired. Um, what's his name from SCTV to Joe Flaherty. Joe, Joe Flaherty. <laughs> and then uh, and and then after he hires him to sabotage Happy Gilmore's game, like he's like, hey, you want to go to Red Lobster or you know Long John Silver's? And he's like, no, I gotta go. And he grabs his arm, and says, hey, I thought we were friends. You know, you don't want to yeah. be that guy. You yeah. know. <laughs> so anyway, um, I want to change gears because I want to talk a little bit about illustration. This is a visual storytelling show. Let's talk about some visual storytelling. Uh, last week, at the very end, uh, Eli Nyberger, uh, Ulotricus on the Twitters, uh, mentioned some stuff about uh, digital illustration and how, uh, you know, can possibly it might be, it might make our lives easier sometimes if we just embraced more digital technology. And that sparked a, a question in my head that says, well, 
would it? Would it? Uh, is it easier? And then and it just so happened, I was very, very fortunate that I got Janie Ho on because you il illustrate in Adobe Illustrator, which to many cartoonists, uh, myself included, is a bit uh, alchemical. Uh, I don't understand how you could possibly illustrate in this program. Um, and then on the other hand, we got Ryan here who travels the world and, uh, you know, you get your computer stolen <laughs> and, and uh, you never know if you're going to get caught in a, in a monsoon and you, you got a deadline to meet. So you once told me that you draw with whatever is nearby, you know. So here we have somebody who is using a very, um, oh, how, 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 what's the word for it? Uh, I don't want to say it, it, impenetrable, but uh, a, l a little bit difficult to understand. Uh, and a non... Mm, I think it's just, it's different. It's a different way of drawing, but yeah, <laughs> just different. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you can show us a little bit about how you do it because we've got we got the okay. laptop plugged into the screen here. So if you could just give us like just like a, a, a brief outline. I know I'm putting you on the spot here, <laughs> but like like cause you, I don't even know what tools you use. Do you use like the paintbrush tool? Do you use the pencil tool? Do you, are you making the paths with the pen tool and then? Well, let's see. Well, I have a setup like this. I do have a laptop or an iMac. I have both, and then I have like a Wacom. I don't even have a bit. Like I even have something even more, less fancy than this. But yeah, so I have a Wacom. But I use the pen tool most of the time. And that's it. I draw. I just pick colors. Well, what tool are you using there when you do this? The pen tool. So what? it's this one. I'm on this, I want to say 90, 95% of the time. I don't. I know a lot of people like to use the shapes tool to make things. Like if I want to do a bunny. Yeah, show us. If you, if you could, just show us a quick bunny. Oops. So you're just using like the shape tool and the pen tool, which just make shapes. I'm just making shapes. No way. I hand draw everything. Uh, you know, even if I want an oval like this, I'm not going to use, I'm not using like the lip tickle too, because I think that's too cold. Yeah, it, it doesn't look like the artist has put their hand on it necessarily. Yeah, so I kind of like the organic feel um, of just using. And then you'll go in and you'll actually mess with the, are, are they Bezier? Yeah, Bezier curves. Bezier curves. You'll actually mess with the handlebars on those on those anchor points mm -hmm. to mess with the curves. I like to kind of like, you know, copy and paste. Oh my gosh. Um, so you're actually just building flat shapes with flat fills of color to start yeah, with. Yeah, so look at this. It's just like three shapes right here. Oh yeah, you're switching to like uh, outline mode to show us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I can make eyes with this. I can, I mean, I like to do a lot of copying and pasting too, but. You guys, for those who not, are not watching the video, this is why you should download the video because I'm watching her just magically make this thing come to life. I'm watching her fingers just work on those keys. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I don't know if people like a can see this part. Because <laughs> this part is important, the, uh, the short, uh, what are, the, what key are commands. the key commands. Yeah. I do a lot of the key commands, so. So yeah, but it's, you know, back to the pen tool again, you can draw a little body, like really. Do you, when you use the pen tool, are you completing the shape, like going back to the, the final point so that the shape is fully completed with the path or you just leave it open, the path open sometimes? Um, depends, it, temp it depends. I don't, I don't connect everything. Like if I'm gonna build this bunny and I'm drawing like feet or something, yeah, for those who are watching on the live stream, uh, this is going to be a little low res, but when this video goes up live, uh, later on, uh, as, as, the, as the high res video, this, this will look much, much better. But uh, Copy and paste. So I didn't realize you used a lot of copy and paste, too. That's, that's actually pretty good. Uh, that, that's got to speed things up a little bit. Yeah. But I can, you know, even if I don't want it to be so symmetrical, I can always, like, you know, move it around, turn or, things around. Or modify the modify curves. Modify the curves so it looks a little bit more organic. Okay, I want to, while you're working, I want to ask Ryan. Um, she's a cheater, isn't she? <laughs> uh, isn't she cheating? I mean, she's using digital tools here to, like, she's not actually drawing <gasps> any tools. Tools are cool, man. <laughs> 
you know, That's this funny. is one of the things. While, while JD keeps working, I want to I bring this up. Every time I see you, and I think this is one of the other reasons that you got a lot of followers on Google+, Plus. every time I talk to you, you always say something that sticks with me for like a long time, and I have to chew on for a long time. I was talking to you about like these style uh, experiments I've been doing with one of the characters from a graphic novel I did, and how I might, I'm thinking about doing it, uh, another another edition in a completely new style. And I said, but some people say to me, um, that's just not done. You just don't change your style midstream like that. And you just kind of shook your head and went, no, no, no. Don't get locked into a style. And then you said something about The Simpsons that I think was really, do you remember what you said? Yeah, well, I was saying, I was talking about how the best, whenever I watch like an animated TV show, the one I always remember is when they would break style just for a moment. Like, everybody remembers the Treehouse of Horror episode where uh, Homer was CG. Mm-hmm. Like in the, was that the first, second season, something like that? Very early on, just because it looked so different and it sticks out in people's minds and I I always thought it'd be really cool if they did like a guest season on The Simpsons yeah. like uh, web cartoonists have like guest week where they have their friends make their comic I thought I, I just think that'd be really cool to have like a an episode by the people who do Spongebob episode by uh, well um, John K John K did John that K, yeah. um, opening but just to have a whole episode yeah. that he did I think would be cool I, I love it when you know, when I when I watch a show that never changes and always looks the same, you turn it on, you can't tell what you know if you're watching a new episode or an old episode, and I lose interest quickly. You know, it, it's it, you and a lot of the cartoonists I'm meeting through doing the show are having a profound impact on my. Uh, assumptions about these kinds of things because I remember talking a while back on Comics Are Great with Dave Roman of Yaytime.com and I was talking about whenever I saw licensed comics, comics based on licensed properties like Spongebob, as a kid it would always bother me if it didn't look just like the cartoon mm-hmm. and then Dave Roman, being the nice guy that he is, said, oh you know I always loved it when I got to see another artist's interpretation on it and like what you're saying, I, yeah it's, it totally makes sense, it, it is it is exciting and, and so my opinion is starting to swing in the other direction nowadays, I'm starting to break free of that comic nerd who got a little bent out of shape like that's not the canonical version. Well, it might also be kind of a uh, um, oh I forgot the word um, uncanny valley thing where if someone is trying to match that style, mm-hmm. but they're not forced to go to a style guide, so it's close but not quite. It looks wrong. Mm-hmm. But then, like, when you get, um, you know, if suddenly uh, SpongeBob looks vastly different and is really cartoony and really big eyes or something, then it's a, it's exciting. It might have been, you know, I don't know which mm-hmm. comics you were looking at, but it might have been something. Well, I was, I was, uh, <laughs> I was talking about Transformers comics. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, uh, uh, yeah, and I just wanted them to look just like they did in the show. Yeah. But that, that, that's like, this. It, ultimately, that's kind of disrespectful to all the artists who are working on it. And you're missing out on the opportunity to see like a different iteration that might be really exciting. Like, yeah, Jonathan Rector is saying in the chat, yeah, look at the poster behind you, jurors. You know, this is a different iteration of the Transformers series mm-hmm. from years ago. So I want to go back to Janie. So what, what have you done now? So are you working on layers at all? Oh, uh, yeah, if it gets complicated. But this is like very simple right now. So I'm not on any layers. So you just use like object arrange or yeah, uh, uh, go to the object menu and then arrange objects to move things back and forth if you need to. Yeah, I use keyboard shortcuts to move things up, or, you know, up and down. But if it gets, you know, obviously if this is a whole scene, I, I have sometimes 20 layers. But... Do you, you know, not having done much illustrating in Illustrator, uh, do you find that you have any kind of like system lag with that many layers? Because like if I'm working on a Photoshop file at 600 DPI and if I, if I got like 15 layers, I'll I'll see some it'll start hogging some resources. Does Illustrator do that? No. Well, I bought a new. I was my old computer did that, and I bought an iMac and a MacBook Pro maybe six months ago. Both of those computers don't have a problem at all, and I use a lot of things like I add textures, I put brushes. Still hasn't you know hasn't failed me yet, so. Quick, quick question. Uh, could you demo how you do like? Because your stuff has like a painterly look to it when you do like the color tones. Like you can create like some really nice textures on the characters with light and shadow. How do you uh, do that? I just literally draw in the shadows, but I also use a lot of um, Photoshop uh, textures. They're bitmap. You can just kind of make your own, like paint your own. Um, well, you can get like CDs of like you know uh, bitmap textures and then you bring them in you do a file place and you just place in like a tiff and i don't know i guess we don't have that but it oh, goes I don't have any... right into illustrator and you can just kind of like put it in does it mask it on top of any objects then like so it's not you just... can mask it yeah but you, well you have to do it yourself but okay you have to mask it on top of it so 
that's how I do it. You know, there's brushes. There's like, different like yeah, analog there's, style like, brushes. In brush libraries. There's artistic. You know, I I really do like the set, the artistic chalk charcoal. So there's like different um. Oh, so, so here it is. Oh wow. Yeah. So you and can that's play all vector that. it's doing right now. It's vector. Oh my gosh. So look. So like one of your so now I can you know I can draw I can put my texture into the bunny if I wanted to like if I make it like a little different colors. Is this Illustrator? What version is this? CS four, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can mask it. I'll be very curious to see how that works. Does it work like how masks work in Photoshop? Because <laughs> I don't know Photoshop that well. <laughs> We're trying to translate between one That's another. Uh, Eulotricus, Eli in the chat is saying vector layers are way less memory intensive than raster layers. So there's another advantage. There's another uh, reason to possibly look at this as a illustration tool. Uh, so you can mask it. Crazy. So, so, so you can, I mean, this is very, but you know, you can add, this way you can add textures in your vector or you can throw in a Photoshop texture file on top of Illustrator, which I know some people think that's a little kind of backwards. You probably want to put the texture in Photoshop, but I'm more comfortable in Illustrator, so yeah, I kind of do go the reverse. Did you find, I mean, how long have you been drawing in Illustrator? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Five, six, seven years? Okay, maybe? so you've been, you've been in the ecosystem for a little while now. D do you remember if there was any kind of leap of logic to think about, because like when you draw on paper, you're laying lines down and then filling in colors afterwards often, right? But now you're l working like almost like in a shape. You know, you're starting with shapes. Yeah, that's why I think it's just it's just a different way of working. It's a different way of working. I mean, I used to like I used to draw still draw hand, you know, by hand and then scan it in. And yeah. then, you know, people think that you're tracing, you, but you I guess you're kind of tracing shapes on top, but I like the look of Illustrator, so Yeah. But now I'm just so used to the pen tool that I don't really need a like a guide, like a hand-drawn guide to place an Illustrator. I just kind of draw this way on top with the pen tool. So. It reminds me of how um Oh, well, yeah, we had Brian Denham on last week. Was that last week? No, two weeks ago. Brian Denham was on, and he does uh, uh, illustrations entirely in Adobe Illustrator, and he has tutorials on his website, which you can check out at uh, comicsagreat.com slash CAG35. Uh, but uh, it just it reminds me of, like, you know, they say in character design, like, you should have, like, really good silhouettes for your characters. So it's sort of like working in that silhouette form rather than working in, like, a contour form. Yeah, I guess so. It's, it's like, back and forth. It's sometimes... Uh... It's not so effective that I, I do sometimes have to kind of, if I want a, a character in a certain position, I do have to kind of quickly, you know, draw by hand and then scan it in or take a picture. But, yeah, I guess it's silhouettes. And also I think my style is also lends itself to kind of that shape, silhouette type of deal. So That's true. That's true. You work in a very abstracted style compared to, I mean, it's not totally representational, right? I mean, I don't know if it's, if, if it's like me, is like I want my style to be that way or I've been working in Illustrator for so long that it kind of affected my style. Maybe that's, a little bit of both. Yeah, that's a really that's a that's actually kind of a deep question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so okay, let's keep going on the style thing for a second. I'm I'm hoping we can get uh, Ryan to do some drawing if you feel like it. Only if you feel like it, man. Uh, okay. Oh, <laughs> what, you, what am I drawing? Uh, fat Garfield. Draw. <laughs> <laughs> Bad Garfields, rather. I draw that rabbit. Um, oh, there we go. There we go. But um, you know. The style, uh, oh, you're using the Pentel color brush pen. Actually, this one, I think, has a fresher okay. charge on it. I've uh, never used one of these before. I have no idea what I'm doing right now. Oh, awesome. Well, that's the way you live your life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you're always in such a good mood. Uh, but so talk about how, like, the style is, is influenced by the tools sometimes, the tool choices that you make, uh, given that you don't have any preferred uh, tools, Ryan. You, you tend to work in a lot of different styles too, right? Yeah, well, I... For most of my work, I tend to use um, just plain uniballs. I tend to carry a lot of those around. Yeah. Um, it's very simple. I can get them at pretty much anywhere I travel. Let's see if I can get them. Um, but a lot of times I, I can't and I have to, or I'll want to do a certain style and look for the tools to do it. Like one of the last chapters of Aki Alliance, I just, for some reason, really decided I wanted to do it with the cheapest watercolors I could find, and I went to the dollar store and got some watercolors because awesome. the book's supposed to look like it's um, a scrapbook put together by an eight-year-old girl. So I just 
I just got really, I'm like, oh my God, that'd be so cool if I just did it with like $1 watercolors. How many colors were in the palette? Um, like six? Like eight, I think. Okay. Wow. I think I only used like three of them. <laughs> <laughs> they were just hideous colors that I, I just mixed out of like the three that, um, it seemed like they would work. But, uh, yeah, I love, I love the, like how you can change the mood of a story by changing like oh look like the the book that I was just reading when I came to the library um by Daniel Klaus Mr. Wonderful um I thought this was interesting because it's a lot of it looks like most of his uh you can see on the camera there like most of his work it's in his style the whole book is kind of like that there's a few breaks where um and if you can see it it's all a lot of the same kind of panel shapes and everything. And uh, if you keep pointing at yeah. the mic while you're talking, I know you're in kind of okay. a tricky position, but yeah. These right. Um, but you can see every once in a while, he'll break into what looks like a, a Peanuts comic down at the bottom, and it totally changes the rhythm. And that's um, this is kind of his what the character is thinking. Uh, and it you immediately, without them saying anything, you get that this isn't this is happening in his head. This is how he wishes. What we're happening, we're going, and it's more, it, you know, that style brings to mind like a more whimsical, uh, you know, because it people think of peanuts, and it's yeah, not, here we go. Everything's yes. really serious, and then all of a sudden, it's really whimsical in what he and wishes were happening. Colors, everything's simple. Even the colors, all these muted tones in the the reality sequences, mm -hmm. but then when it switches to his inner, what, what's going on inside of his head, it switches to simpler lines and brighter colors. Yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah, and that that really changes how you feel about it. But even still, it's still sticking to the the same kind of panel panels and there's a few moments like this one um uh the one i just passed um <laughs> no. but there's one where all of a sudden you get this and it's like the, with the shape of the book this is like just this huge panel that just stops the book cold because he changed the way he was making the book and yet it, it's a moment where the character is just completely dumbfounded and shocked and you really get exactly what he's feeling just because he took the time to you know think about what would make this have the most impact rather than okay i have to draw him like this because this is how i draw characters it makes me think of um that comic that you did that you posted on google plus uh z was the title of that one right where you were uh doing you were playing this what was a taco bell game it was a taco bell game where you have to collect all the letters yeah. and spell godzilla mm -hmm. and then you went what was a million dollars something like yeah, that you won a million dollars spell godzilla and you got the z first threw it away yeah because i you know I just, my friend won a taco and i got a z and i'm like i'm gonna collect <laughs> all these and then you wound up later on collecting some of the other letters in godzilla and you got all of them except z mm -hmm. And then you, uh, the, the ending of the story, I've used this in my classroom is because it's such a, a, a really thoughtful moment how you arrange the panels uh, to where you call the company to see if you can get another game piece. And then they say to you on the phone, there was only one Z. And then when you, when you hear the words, there was only one Z, it's this long, narrow panel closing in on you sitting on the floor holding the phone with the look on your face that where you realize you just threw away a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Which is a true story. So, <laughs> you threw a million dollars in the trash. Uh, I hope I hope it doesn't hurt too much anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I would. My life. My life is amazing. And if I if I were a millionaire, seventeen year old, I did. <laughs> I can't imagine. Who knows all I the dumb things yeah. you would have done? Yeah. So. Okay. Well. Um, while while Ryan's finishing uh, the bunny, uh, Janie, mm -hmm. I'm wondering I'm wondering if you could do you ever think about like working in different styles or is is the is this kind of like a a background thing because what's really important right now is just getting the work done. Like you're too busy making the work to really think too much about experimenting with different styles. Like like in your sketchbooks and things, do you ever play around with different looks and different tools to your work or? I I don't know about that different looks, but maybe kind of another step off my style maybe nothing not a completely different but i feel like there's always improvement i don't think my style is just static yet. yes it's static i mean it's obviously i get work from it you know that's great i get my bills paid but there's a different level of what i want to do with what i have now i guess building on it not really just off to a different direction what pushes so. you to build on it anything in particular 
I don't know. I'm always. I mean, I don't it's think like you can always be satisfied with your style. I mean, I've been doing this for like a little bit, and you also get bored a little bit yeah. sometimes with your own stuff. So, and you're always looking at other people's stuff, and you're like, oh my god, that that's amazing, and <laughs> you kind of want to add that on top of what I'm doing. So, but I'm also very specific about what I like. So, I don't yeah. know if I I, I wanted to build something different, but maybe build on top of it. When you look at somebody else's stuff and say, oh, that's amazing, uh, and how do you, is there a switch that you can flip, or does this even register with you guys? Like, sometimes when I see somebody's work who's amazing, I'll be like, oh, man, I'll never, I'll never be able to pull that off. Uh, sometimes instead of inspiring me to work harder and push myself in different directions, it'll, it'll stunt me, you know? It'll, it'll get me, like, into those pits of self-torture that artists like to do to themselves sometimes. Uh, is, that, is that something you guys struggle with, or is it something where, you know, it just doesn't even happen? Or if it does, how do you get yourself out of that and, and use it to push yourself forward? Well, when I see something like that, I always um, just think, you know, it d d doesn't necessarily work on every project. This wouldn't work for the project I'm working on right now. What I do whenever I see something like that is I have a folder on my desktop that I just drag it to, and then every once yeah. in a while I just flip through that folder and look at all the images and like, oh, this, the, you know, doing the arm like this would work with this, or this kind of background would work, um, or the simple color palette would work with this project or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I definitely have that too. The, the, the ever built, like big folder on my desktop, I usually like to just drag, drag, drag. It just says inspiration. Oh, that's a great idea. It could be just anything. And then when you start a new project, sometimes like a personal project, maybe it's not for a client because a client maybe expects you to do, you know, your your style. But if you're experimenting, I kind of like to, I mean, an illustrator anyway, I like to place the images that I pulled and just be like, why did I like this image? You know, sometimes it's just the color, like we said, the color palette. It could be the way that the people look or it could be anything. And then you kind of want to try, you know, try it out like a little bit of, whatever you're liking onto your own style. Yeah. It works sometimes. Yeah, I notice that whenever I do, whenever I try to draw in someone else's style, my style always changes, even if it doesn't change to be similar to theirs. Like, um, you know, like whenever I do like those bad Garfields, I'm not even drawing in Jim Davis's style, but because, right. I, because I'm trying to get out of what I normally draw, like some of the early one bad Garfields I did, that is completely, now I draw everything like that bad Garfield. <laughs> Even though it came from nowhere other than right. me, it's not my, it wasn't my style. Right. And I remember there was a, I was doing, it happens a lot when I do guest strips for people. Mm. And the, I remember one, I did a guest strip and uh, I noticed some, some, somehow the artist drew like black hair, like she left a space in uh, that she didn't, didn't fill it in all with black. She would like draw like a, reflection area in there and I did I did that kind of I didn't realize I was doing it a different way than she did and I started doing that all the time and I started talking about how I stole that from her and she's like what are you talking about I I, I thought that was cool and I started stealing it from you so we both <laughs> thought that we had stolen it from each other and I looked back and, oh she didn't do that I just that's how my mind interpreted what she did and then she saw that and then started interpreting how I did it oh that's so cool that is so cool how I can organically yeah yeah, yeah. and th that is yeah that's how I can I, I think when I think about it drawing other people's characters doing guest strips also you know just like I did those he-man reimaginings for yeah. a while on my site and like just like having to uh, interpret somebody else's ideas can sometimes give you insight into where you want to go with your own stuff, right? When, mm -hmm. you know, because in every, when I started doing those front reimaginings, reimagining re my own characters and that style I was using for the He-Man reimaginings, uh, it never even occurred to me. It, it didn't even cross my mind once that, hey, maybe I should be using this style on my own characters. I was just doing it for this fun little experiment thing. So just yeah. doing jam comics, drawing. I completely or... forgot that it was your style. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the the the, yeah. the new one. Yeah, because it's still your style. It's not the He Man style. It's the style right. you invented for that. It, yeah, it's a style I invented to interpret the characters in a new way. Yeah, so yeah, it's it... the same thing I do with that bad Garfield. Like I, yeah. I I used a similar design for a character I did, and I'm like, oh, I can't do. It. I'm stealing from Jim. Day oh, wait a minute, Jim <laughs> Davis doesn't actually draw like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you should explain the bad Garfields things. That's another thing you can find on your Google Plus account. Oh, it's just a. A thing that I like to do whenever I can't think of what to draw or like if I meet up with artists and it's kind of awkward. Like I, I just can't think of what to draw and I feel awkward. So I just start drawing bad Garfields. <laughs> <laughs> and like as off model as possible. And, and you've got a huge collection things. of them now. Yeah. Um, but, but not only just from yourself, but from other artists. Yeah. Know, that was the cool thing when you posted that, that gallery on Google+. Because bad Garfields are fun because everyone knows what Garfield looks like. It's a good and social lubricant. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, everybody knows Garfield and it's easy to... 
it's easy to draw even if you don't have a picture in front of you. And if you don't have a picture in front of you, it ends up so much better because it's just. <laughs> Um, okay, you know, I want to give you guys a chance for any final thoughts on everything we talked about today. I mean, in terms of like, you know, digital versus analog versus, uh, you know, f you know, finding your place in the social medias. I, I say this because the last time we were together, I totally cut you off, Ryan. And I was like, okay, it's time to go. We're going to get out of here. And then you were like, I, then, nope, never mind. See you later. So is there anything left, uh, you know, tumbling around in, in the brain pans that you wanted to summarize this with? I've got a, I got a, I got a final question if you want me to throw that, but it doesn't have a, a whole lot to do with everything we've been yeah, doing. Yeah, I know you're asking that because that was my suggestion, but I have nothing else to add right now. <laughs> okay, well, last it, time I'm well, like Jersey, why didn't you ask? Like, <laughs> yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> oh, that's the way it goes. Uh, so Google Plus pages. That I mean, we were talking about Google Plus earlier. What do you guys think of them? I don't. Um, I don't really understand. I, I know there's ways to use it, but for like an artist, I don't understand why I would use it personally because I've already built a big following of people who are interested in, in the stuff that I post and the way that I post it. So why would I make a separate page and have to start over from zero mm -hmm. to get them to look at it? Yeah. And the other, only other option is posting it to both, but then why would anyone follow one of them if I'm just posting the same stuff? Right. I think it, it, the, it comes back to what I said about making it as easy as possible for people to look at your stuff. And if they have to find you and then read on your page that you post this stuff to this other this other group, it's making too many steps for them to get to the stuff. Just give it to them. I've been I've been really wrestling with it. Uh, there is a Commerce of Great Google Plus page, and it's got a couple hundred uh, followers now. And yeah, you can find it at Google Plus. Uh, just search for Comics are Great. Uh, and it does allow for more granular sharing, right? So I don't have to pollute my feed with a whole bunch of comics, great stuff. But this is a part of my life. This is why, you know, like, I, I wonder if this, like, is somehow the use case is dependent on how you characterize yourself as a person who shares online. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that the three of us, for the most part, share mostly only professional stuff online, right? Mm -hmm. Like what we're working mm -hmm. on. Try, yeah. I would say 80% is art professional stuff. Right. Or, or you know, like you and Danny Jones will get into a whole gripe match about clients. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, oh, I hate it when they do this to me. But it's still professional talk, right? Oh, it's, yeah, definitely. Show yeah, talk. it's kind of off the record. It's kind of personal, but it's also, it's mostly professional. Like, it's not, uh, for me, it's kind of hard to even wrap my brain around the notion of, like, what would I share beyond, like, what I'm thinking about in terms of comics or teaching comics or you know, talking about comics. So I wonder if the, like the use case is more like, okay, well, I want my main feed to be like my personal feed and I want these pages to be sort of like the, the holding buckets for all the different projects I'm involved in. Um, somebody online, I forget, I forget his name. Uh, oh, Ken Drab, he started up, he said he's going to move his entire site to a Google Plus page, or at least he's going to mirror it. He's going to like, you know, use that because the, the reason being is that it's a push system rather than a pull system, right? Like a yeah. website is a pull system. Google Plus, it pushes. And I thought, well, is that analogous to, you know, as a guy who does podcasts, I've got an audience who subscribes through a podcatcher through iTunes, and then it just gets fed to them. They don't really go to the site all that much to like mm -hmm. look at the show notes. And that's why I keep mentioning the show note links. Uh, and then I got a, an audience that actually gets the podcast from the website, two different audiences, but they add up to one audience. I wonder if that's the use case, right? Because now I've got like, so what I was thinking is like, well, wonder what would happen if I did a webcomic on a webcomic site, but then I also did a Google Plus page for it, and then the audience could decide, well, I want it pushed to me, so I'll get notified whenever there's new updates, or I can just go to the site and check in every once in a while. Yeah, that might make sense. If you're posting something regularly, it can be basically like a feed rather than posting the comic to your... And then another thing I, I just thought, like, we were talking before about uh, people who do, like, all-ages stuff, and then they do more adult stuff. You know, they might want to have a page just for that so it's safe and they don't have to worry about what they say on their... Good point. Account. Very good point. Yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to get your take on yeah. it as, as two people who swim in those waters a little bit. Uh, so, okay, well, let's, let's, let's do this. I'm going to close out this uh, and, and let Eli come in here for some book recommendations in a second. Uh, but gosh, oh gosh, guys, this was a really, really, really fun talk. Thank you so much for, you know, and Janie, especially thanks to you for being so easygoing oh. about the Illustrator <laughs> demo. No, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people are curious. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd love to have you back for like even more uh, kind of like hands-on stuff. And I mean, yeah. I should also talk to ADL about getting you to come in and do a class on it. But then we'd have to get a bunch of <laughs> Illustrator equipped machines for yeah. that. That'd be the hard part. Uh, or, or, or you can uh, maybe uh, I'll talk to you later about that stuff. But, uh, so, Janie Ho, chickengirldesign.com. Yep. 
chickengirl.blogspot.com. You still there? Chickengirldesign.blogspot. Yep. Oh, chickengirldesign.blogspot.com. Well, where, what other places can we find you? Um, on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, just my name, Janie Ho. Yeah. I kind of go back and forth with Chicken Girl and Janie Ho, but yeah. <laughs> and are, are you on the Tumblrs too? No, no, no. Oh. I've been overwhelmed with like so many. I know. I'm just like, I kind of have to cut it off. I know, bit, I know. There's two darn many too nowadays, many, but... you know. Uh, these days, I'm just using Posteris to post to a whole bunch of different ones because there's just so many to stay on, on top of. It, it could easily be two hours a day just posting things. Yeah. Uh, like, you, like you need that when you got drawings to do. So, okay. So the Google Plus, the Twitters, and Twitter, the Facebook. Facebook, find me. Yep. And then, uh, especially on Twitter, because then you get involved every once in a while in those kidlet chats. It's a hash, hashtag conversation thread okay. that happens every once yeah, in a while. Yeah, there's a lot of variations now. So Are there? Um, yeah, a lot of, like, different, they've spawned off to different ones. But sometimes, uh, yeah, I, tr I try to be on there <laughs> every <laughs> Thursday, like 9 Eastern time, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Ah, Thursdays, so. well, there we go. Okay, well, thank you very much, Janie. It was, it was awesome having you here again. Thanks. Uh, hopefully it doesn't take 20 episodes again before I get you back. Uh, Ryan, Ryan, um, we're working on uh, covertly trying to keep you here in the United States, but who knows? You may not be here after Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's awesome to have you in studio. And Ryan Estrada of? Uh, everything's on ryanestrada.com and any social network. I'm, I'm just Ryan Estrada. I'm everywhere. Yep. I mostly post on Google Plus these days the most because like I post on Facebook I I get like my mom responding and I post on <laughs> Google Plus and I get like 20,000 comments so oh that reminds me when you posted your passport you had to get a new passport and so you were saying goodbye to your old passport and you posted pictures of all the different pages from it on your Google Plus yeah. page and the best part was when I heard the tires squeal like the brakes yeah. hit and you're like I just shared my passport with 30,000 people maybe I shouldn't have done that is that dangerous yeah. it turned out it wasn't that's right? not, fine okay yeah, <laughs> I probably should have checked. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you're going to have to be a lot more mindful about what you say and do now because you got a lot of eyes on you, right? Mm. But, uh, yeah, so you can get the complete Ryan Estrada collection at ryanestrada.com slash complete. Yes. Mm. Uh, download everything. And he won't even know because you're not even tracking it. Well, thanks again, Ryan. So, okay, so I'm going to make some noises for a few seconds. Uh, Eli's going to come in the door, and I'm going to have to ask you guys to, uh, you right. know, leave for a second so Eli can come in. Uh but then I will also, I'll hold up this drawing that Ryan did. And uh, later on, if Ryan is okay with it, I'll make it available on comicsgreat.com uh, for, for some lucky winner. That is a horrible drawing. <laughs> no one wants that. Somebody wants it. Somebody That's out there. That's drawn with me reaching around the microphone. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, now we have Eli Nyberger, Ulotricus. Of, of uh, the Ann Arbor District Library. Look how fast you, you can move. How you doing? <laughs> Good to see I'm you. I'm a man of action. <laughs> how are you, Jersey? I'm, I'm, this was fun. This was super fun. Thank yeah. you guys for the, the rapid, rapid fire setup and for the. Little rise it's... to the challenge. You know? Yeah, yeah Matt, seriously. Make it happen. So. You guys are heroes. So, okay, what are we talking about today? What, what's going on? What, what, what news things do you want to make some noise about? Let's see. Well, you know, we got something. I think I talked about this a little bit last week. Our big project right now is the, uh, the Freeing John Sinclair Rally. That launches uh, December 10th is the 40th anniversary of this legendary rally in Ann Arbor hippie history. So that's the big thing that's occupying us right now, not yeah. terribly cr uh, related to comics and such. Other than that, um, a big part of their movement was this legendary poster designer named, post, named uh, Gary Grimshaw. And he did the original poster, he did all kinds of amazing posters in the 60s and 70s, and we actually had him do the poster for the new event. So uh, it's been a very interesting thing, but he's, you know, the whole kind of poster scene is an is a mm. interesting beast as, as far as the way that they, they make their money. But, yeah. uh, but I did, uh, in keeping with today's theme, I picked up a couple travelogue graphic novels uh. down in the, <laughs> in the basement. Um, this is awesome. There's a couple of these that are really, really uh, awesome. And, okay, let's see. Is this, is this so, in the shot? Okay. Oh, uh, okay. We got it. It was the paper in the shot. And yep. we'll see. Yeah, there we go. Okay, yep. excellent. Got it. So uh, this is French Milk. I thought I had talked about this one before, but I looked through the show notes and I, uh, maybe not. So this is by Lucy Knis Knisley. Um, or Nisley, I'm not sure how you say it. It's very much just a travelogue of, uh, you know, her sketchbook from a trip that she and her mom took to Paris to celebrate her 21st birthday or 22nd birthday or something like that. And, you know, it's really cute. It's very, you know, she's got a, a wonderful hand-drawn style. Uh, she mixes it in with photos and tells you, you know, I mean, you really get the sense of the story of, uh, oh, thank you. You really get the sense of the story of uh, her trip. Um, 
it's also a very accurate picture into the life of a somewhat angsty and self-obsessed 21 year old <laughs> person because it's like you know she's here in paris and she's depressed because someone did better work than her back at home or all this kind of stuff and it's like man you know it's just this is your 20s right here in this book <laughs> look at it for everyone so this is really cute it does a nice job it's also a nice kind of coming of age story because it's very much about her relationship changing with her mom as she becomes an adult definitely all hand drawn um and you can also kind of see that she just you know she just went forward and didn't look back you know this was her sketchbook there's no opportunity to kind of navel gaze on it and you could tell that there's a uh, some stuff in the acknowledgments about that it was hard to let this work that wasn't really intended for publication go and it's not all that different from uh, our crumbs placemat thing that we were looking at right. the other week right so that's uh, french milk by lucy knisley and uh, that's a good one I also got two other ones here about Asia. This is Tonoharu. Uh, this is by, what's his name? Uh, Lars, Ma Lars Martinson. Um, this is the first of what I think is planned as a six-part graphic novel. And basically, he was an English teacher in a pretty remote village in Fukuoka in Japan. And this is just his story of doing that. And he's got a super sharp graphic style. Yeah. Very, very... Uh, Fixed with lines. Yeah, it reminds yeah. you a little bit of um, Chris Ware-ish. Yeah, definitely. That's cool, yeah. And, you know, the text on everyone, there's very few word balloons. It's almost all the narrative set in text above it. And, you know, it's one of those uh, fish-out-of-water, gaijin isolation stories, and it's very challengingly done. And, and, you know, you really get into the feel of it. Uh, I don't know if any of the – in the back page it says there's six other volumes coming. I don't know if any of them are in I have not production. heard of this. Who put this out? So this is Pliant Press. Hmm. Um and I know this was boing boinged when it first came out. Uh, so there's some some real potential there. So I like this book a lot. It's very quick read. And again, one of those stories where you just really get the sense, especially because, you know, as Americans, we can't read the Japanese, you know, so mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. oh, well, that's how he felt because he could barely <laughs> speak it when he arrived there. You know, he was uh -huh. so really interesting book. That's Tonuharu by Lars Martinson. And then I know I brought one of his books before. This is Guy Delisle, who uh, is a French guy, a French Canadian, and he did a lot of work managing overseas in betweening shops for French animation and French Canadian animation projects. So he's got one book called Shenzhen, he's got one called Pyongyang, mm -hmm. which are all his like his experiences being, the, in some cases, the sole foreigner working at an overseas animation shop. Uh, so this is his Burma Chronicles, uh, which is much more about his kind of personal family uh, experiences living in Burma. Uh, again, this is clearly hand-drawn, very, very vibrant and personal style, lots of great text in here, and he really, in all of his books, gives you such a great, great sense of the, the life uh, that he lives in each of these different countries. And Looks like the characters are rendered in kind of a graphical style, but the lines are rendered in a like a very kind of uh, neurotic, wiggly, hand done look. Yeah. 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 And again, it's clearly, and it kind of, I think it all ties into some of the stuff that you guys are talking about that we kind of got into a little bit next week, which is, you know, this whole kind of challenge between the digital and the, uh, the digital and the analog, I suppose, yeah. production processes. Because, you know, I mean, you could see just watching someone as experienced as Janie, an illustrator, just tear it up, Yeah, you know? And you're like, oh my God, what have I been doing, right? Right. So, but I think that part of the challenge is, you know, you certainly, if you're really good with the sketch pad, you can toss something off on the sketch pad and, you know, but I think the big challenge for any creator, but I think more so for cartoonists, is uh, overcoming, you know, dysmorphism for your work. Mm. You know, it's like it's never good enough. Oh, know? yeah. And for, I think, a lot of people, making the step to illustrator means that there's nothing you can't go back on. You know, there's nothing that's there forever. Everything is open to criticism and self-criticism and, and navel-gazing. You know that that was a missed opportunity. I should I should bring Janie back in to respond to that. I don't know if you can hear us, Janie. If you could come in here and talk Janie's about still that, out there? because that that is something where it's it's really opening the doors to just to just never stop. Let me see if I can grab her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's too it's too good to not get her back in here. Okay. So I wonder if you can speak to this, Janie. I don't know if you heard us talk about this thing about like working in Adobe Illustrator means you have infinite undos. Yes. And well, conceivably infinite undos. So how do you stop yourself? from not second guessing every line, every shape, every color you choose. I think I was talking to somebody about that on Twitter. Like that's that's the problem. You start being a control freak a little bit. Yeah. You want to control every single line. Colors are infinite. You know, you keep changing and changing and changing, but 
Yeah. We learned to stop it, or there's a deadline. Oh. <laughs> you have to stop. <laughs> yeah. So, I guess. But, so, so, like, if you're not working, if you're working on a personal project, maybe just an egg timer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's but like, it's, ding, you're done with this page. But it's like the it. control freak. It, yeah, the lines can be nip- manipulated. Things yeah. can be shifted. I can around imagine for time. a certain type of creator, it's like throwing gasoline on a flame. You know, to say it's like, <laughs> hey, guess what? There's nothing that's set in stone anymore about your work. And oh, yeah. that's really, I think, the, the, the challenge in that. You know, when, uh, at, if you've ever seen some of the video of uh, Jerry, uh, or rather Mike uh, Krahuliak from, mm. uh, you know, uh, Tyke, right. Gabe from, from Penny, Penny Arcade. Arcade. Yeah. You know, when he draws, his habit is he, and I, I think he works in Photoshop, not Illustrator. You know, he mm-hmm. does brush work. And I think, you know, his habit is if you watch the video, he draws each line like six times in rapid succession. It's like zit, erase, zit, erase, zit, erase, zit. Oh, there it is. Yeah. You know, and then he just iterates it so quickly. Yeah. And you can see that that's just his habit. But then once it's there, it's there. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's really kind of a big challenge. You develop an eye for that maybe yeah. after a while. Uh, another thing I think about is this is very similar to sketching is one of the things I tell my students is that when they watch me sketch and like you're using lots of lines, like I'll like scribble six, seven lines in order to get a, like a, like the contour of an arm. And I say, well, I draw six, seven lines because only one of them's right, but I got to throw down the six wrong ones before I can get to that seventh right one. Uh, I can see that on a sketch, but it's harder to sort of like imagine that when you're on a screen because you have that infinite undo. I just didn't know if you had any kind of... I guess it's something that you just pick up. You, you get a uh, an eye for it after doing it enough. Yeah, you want. Yeah, you want to want your artwork in a certain way. So I don't know. It's a, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think for personal projects, that's when it goes a little crazy. But with client work, there's a deadline. Just got to get it out there. It's been an ongoing theme for the last several episodes of this idea of like letting go of something and just getting the work out and not being precious about it. I think that's a, another sort of mindset that everybody needs to have about work, right? So. Well, I think another thing, you know, just a, again, as a reader, um, the art doesn't matter as much as the artist tends to think it does as far as whether or not it go to the next page. I you ju- know, I just had a discussion yesterday with Kim Holm, who's going to be on next week, Dan Unger Holm on the Twitters, uh, cartoonarchy.com. And he was criticizing my graphic novel, The Front, and he said that it's too dense. You're trying to uh, get through, you're trying to do story flow, composition, have detailed backgrounds, and have tons and tons of dialogue and lots of jokes. It's like when you do all of that, it's like it's, it's just it's sensory overload. And the, through the discussion, we came to the, conclu- the conclusion that I wrote that book for artists. I thought, I was thinking of my audience as, what can I do to wow my fellow artists? Yeah. And as a result of that, I potentially alienated readers because they're not noticing all of that artistry that I'm putting into that, right? So that's something we also have to think about, too, is they're, the audience isn't going to see a lot of that kind of stuff. And, you know, I know that I really loved a graphic novel when I go back and look at the pictures. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The first time through, you hardly even look. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like, it's like, you know, you're, you want to know what happens next, if it's a good story. Three and then seconds it's like, a page. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, if it really grabs you, then you're like, oh, I got to go back and linger over this. But you got to get to that end before someone has that motivation to go back and really kind of savor the art. And I think that that's, you know, that's a challenge. And, you know, I, I come at this as a, a manager of creatives where I'm always saying, <laughs> it's good enough, ship it, Yeah. you know? Yeah. So I think that that's a big I challenge, think, especially for the independent artist who is working, you know, as as a web comic or as a self published thing, where you're the entire production chain from top to bottom. Mm-hmm. I think that that's I can just imagine how hard it is to get lost down those. You know, I I, th- I think I think you 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 summarize it really nicely. I think that's a nice thinking exercise for cartoonists is think about that second read. You're writing it for the second read, right? So don't be precious about it. Do it good enough so that they'll want, and make the com- characters and story compelling enough and interesting enough that they'll want to go back and do the second read. That's a good way of thinking about it. Thank you for that, Eli. Uh, this is, this is I'll, I'll talk about this off camera, <laughs> but we, we're, we're trying to come up with a title for your segment on the show. Uh, so I can come up with like a cool graphic <laughs> to run across the screen. And we got to come oh, up with man. a name for that. So, uh, and and what, what, some of the things you always do is you always find books that are appropriate to the discussion and you always come in with a closing thought. And I don't want to call it Jerry Springer's closing thought. <laughs> How about Eli talks about stuff he has no idea about? How's it, that's that's probably a little closer. Eli's faking <laughs> it again. <laughs> that's right. Faking it with authority. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh man! So thank you guys so much. Anything else you want to throw a word out about before we go? Uh, just you know, I think we're starting to talk about kids read comics, and you oh. know that's going to oh, be wow. really exciting, big thing here at ADL, and yeah, uh, looks like we're going to hopefully get it organize some other things that are going on in town, and I'm yeah. excited to start having news about that. 
Yeah, kidsreadcomics.org. More news to come in the coming weeks. So, yes, that's going to be happening at the Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, very, very, very excited about that one. I hope you can come to that, Janie. Uh, it's uh, July 7th and 8th. Should we still be around? Oh, awesome. Uh, still in Ann Arbor, so... <laughs> Okay, cool. So uh, thank you to Eli and the Ann Arbor District Library, and thank you guys for downloading and listening. This will be at uh, the audio podcast will be at comicsgreat.com. The video will be available at youtube.com slash comicsgreat and very soon at aadl.org. So until next time, everybody, I've been uh, Jersey Drozd of comicsgreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye. <laughs>